uh, Phil Kogan's on vacation. He's away in the service for two weeks. And I have a guest here, a young gentleman who has listened to the show from, from the very first one, Harry, yeah. in June. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, somebody lives on the Monterey Peninsula, uh, Harry Powell. And he and his wife have listened since the very first show I had. And they tape every show. You have every one of them, right? And they Missing two. Missing two. And exactly. we'll get those caught up. And Harry has turned on a lot of people to the reading material and to the research, and he is reading many, many books. They're a perfect couple. They're just the way I wish every listener would be. There is five. Oh. You find it interesting? It's kind of interesting, I think so. What's, what book are you reading now? Uh, I'm reading The Third Reich, and uh, I'm also going to get into uh, the Ross book. Um, Invisible government. Yeah, the invisible government. Yeah, the Third Reich is a good one to read now at election time, uh, when you see how the government is manipulating the courts of law. And you're talking about the Justice Department, the Third Reich. Yeah, I just finished that chapter. Yeah, the political assassinations are so closely related to the overthrow of Germany after World War One, and then the people that moved into this country, the Germans, and affected the political assassinations in this country. That if you sit and read that as a textbook. That's a good place to begin to understand Dealey Plaza. So uh, Harry's going to participate with me today and talk about Dealey Plaza. We'll use the format that we do every week on the show, take the news of the week, and relate it to the past political assassinations. Uh, there was a bur building that burned down in Dealey Plaza, the Texas School Depository Building. And some of you that are too young, school book, school book depository, uh, I should know it by now. Some of you listeners uh, are not aware of all the controversy that centered about that building in 1963, 64, and 65. And hopefully the people that were involved in the assassination wanted the controversy to end. Uh, we'll discuss what happened in that building briefly, and then we'll discuss why the building was set fire two days ago. Uh, the sixth floor window up on the left far side was where Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to have been at the time that John Kennedy was killed. As soon as the law enforcement officers came to the building and went right into the building, Oswald was downstairs at the Coke machine on the second floor having a Coca-Cola. The elevator was broken. No one in the stairway, after all that excitement, saw him running down the stairs. He's never been identified by any person as having been seen on the sixth floor of the building. He was down there having a Coca-Cola when, when the policeman entered the building. Uh, the researchers took the movie, the famous Zapruder movies, and recreated the shooting of John Kennedy according to the time frames of, of from the moment he was shot in the movie until his head was blown off. And they recreated it into so many seconds that the tra car traveled and the shots could take place. And in that amount of time period, the gun that Oswald was supposed to have owned, which he didn't own, could only shoot three bullets. So in reconstructing the crime in Dallas and the killing of John Kennedy, they had to allow for only three bullets and no more. Have you read any of those books, Harry? Uh, Justine's book? Yeah, I read uh, Justine's book. Yeah, the controversy. Of course, you met uh, uh, Sprague, when you said Richard That's Sprague, right. who recreated the... Uh, Time thing, the problem with the bullet, and Cutler, who had a whole lecture and a book on the... I didn't read Cutler. Right? We haven't read his book. Well, the, the point was that Lee Harvey Oswald, if he had been in the sixth floor and if he had owned a gun, would have shot John Kennedy uh, in the back, five and five-eighths inches below his neck, and the bullet had to exit, uh, be the same bullet that went out of him and had to exit in his Adam's apple, which went uphill, which is against the law of physics. And from the sixth floor of the depository, the direction of the bullet would go straight down. So they were stuck with a problem because one bullet exited, and uh, they locked up the x-rays of John Kennedy's body. They're locked in the National Archives as long as you want them locked up. Right now, the government says 75 years. We're trying to get them open. The x-rays were never used by the Warren Commission to uh, show how many holes were in John Kennedy's body. And his coat is locked up for 75 years. It would give the answer to some of those questions. But a year ago, a man bought the Texas School Depository Building because he was interested in reconstructing what he said, the history of the Kennedy murder. And he collects uh, items from the Kennedy's, uh, uh, I guess, thing. I don't know what he has that isn't in the Kennedy Library, books and information, facts on the assassination. Mm -hmm. He's from Nashville, Tennessee, Mr. Mayhew. And he bought 
this Texas School Depository building. And the city of Dallas was simply furious because since the assassination, no one's ever been allowed on the sixth floor to examine the window where Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to have shot. And from the fifth floor window, some people were up there, and the Warren Commission went to the fifth floor, not to the sixth, because that even makes the bullet going higher up when you're shooting down. So the Warren Commission went to the fifth floor, and the photographs that they took out the window, um, there was a tree directly in the way of the scope if Oswald had shot from that window. Other researchers have said he shot from other windows. On The, the gun that uh, shot Kennedy from the back, one of the bullets came from the sixth floor farther down the hall but it wasn't where Oswald was standing. But the window has never been able to be used. No one has been allowed on the sixth floor since 1962. Yeah, the only tests were on it were by the Warren Report. And, and they the didn't FBI. go to the sixth floor. No, they, they didn't go to the sixth floor. And then CBS had a show, and Jim Garrison arrested Clay Shaw, then CBS and NBC wanted to come in and show that uh, the Oswald shooting was the accurate report and there was no conspiracy. So they, again, duplicated the shots with a gun that wasn't Oswald's that, at all, that, that didn't even, when the Warren Commission tried to duplicate it, they couldn't do, you mm. know, what the best marks in the country tried to do, they couldn't duplicate Oswald. And they didn't use the sixth floor. So they were left with the coat of John Kennedy, which is locked in the archives, and the x-rays of his body, which is locked in the archives. And I brought in a list of things that have been destroyed that we'll never see forever. But they were left with this school building, and this man bought it, and it, it belonged to a, an oilman by the name of Harold Byrd. So uh, in November 71, there was a big fuss in Dallas about buying this building. And they, a lot of people came up with offers to Mr. Mayhew because they realized that it would be possible to get access to that sixth floor. They didn't realize what this oil man was doing when he bought it. He thought he, They thought he was one of them, I guess. So they sold it. So right away, offers came, and they wanted to tear it down for a museum. That was one of the offers. Uh, he wanted to tear it down and build a great big museum, a Kennedy Museum. Mm -hmm. And then the Dallas people said, no, that would be a honky-tonk tourist trap. Well, they didn't want too many people at Dealey Plaza. They still have hundreds every day, four or 500 people come every single day and take pictures of that corner. I've seen it myself. I went there, couldn't get in the depository. So they said, well, let's do some other kind of a museum. And somebody wanted to buy, make it a wax museum, <laughs> turn it into a wax museum mm -hmm. and have control of the building. And then there was another offer of a million dollars to take the bricks away from the building, just take the bricks out, anything to keep that window from being available to duplicate the shot. Somebody wanted to buy the window also. They wanted to buy the window. Somebody said, let us just buy the window was that for a horror museum <laughs> we're going to have a horror museum they said this is from the uh, san jose mercury and from newsweek 1971 november i'm reading an article here we'll turn it into a let us have the window sill and the bricks from the building will make a horror museum and mr may who said no i'm not going to do that and we're not going to have a wax museum we're not going to do that and then they said, well, that building isn't safe. Just leave the front and tear out the whole back, and nobody could get up to <laughs> this it. Is, it's ridiculous. So they said, let's tear out the whole thing. He said, no, he's not going to do that. That isn't what he had in mind. He said what he had in mind was to study the whole Kennedy assassination and see what happened. This is what he had in mind. Continuing. Study. He wanted to make a continuous study. Mr. Mayhew came from Nashville, Tennessee, and said, I want to make a continuous study of what happened in the Kennedy assassination. Well, you can imagine how popular that was in Dallas, Texas. And so what he said, they were trying to take the building away from him in November. And Mr. Mayhew said, they'll take it over my dead body. I'll fight it with everything I have, and I'll take it all the way to Supreme Court. Well, since November, the Supreme Court is made up of Nixon's lawyers, so that, those avenues are erased anyway. You know, people have such confidence in this system, like uh, McGovern said, if I don't get those votes, you know, at the election, I'll take the Supreme Court. Well, luckily, he got, you know, the, uh, the arrangement the way it, it should have been. But people have such confidence in the Supreme Court and the system that's oppressing them. Has it, it brings to mind the way uh, Adolf Hitler used the system in the Third Reich. Uh, all the way through the 30s, he... Uh, used uh, the same Weimar Constitution in order to pass all his laws. And that was a very uh, Constitution that he overthrew. So. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was the, the Constitution he used to make 
his law is legal. To, well, Inspection for Disarmament, that book by Melman, he tells how from the Supreme Court on down, all the courts of law had to be reversed and judges selected so the innocent look guilty and the guilty look mm. innocent. So Mr. May was going to go to a court of law, but he doesn't have to bother because this week the building was just burned down the fifth and sixth floor and they left gasoline cans all around to let him know what happened. And the implication was that he was behind on a payment with the Dallas Bank. Well, if he wanted to burn his building down and get the insurance for it because he was broke, he, first of all, he could have made a lot of money just selling the place over again, a big property. He could have made 100000 just selling the bricks from the sixth floor made window. 350000 because he paid six fifty and he's offered a million. Yeah, well, if he just wanted to take yeah. the bricks off the building, right. a million. he wouldn't have lost his payment. And they left... If, if he was going to burn it for insurance reasons, he wouldn't have left the gasoline cans on the fifth floor. It was just a flagrant, we'll show you how we're doing it. It was similar to the Ku Klux Klan type of thing, just burned down. They just left the gasoline cans, didn't bother the bottom because there's nothing downstairs the people had wanted, and right. they burned the fifth and sixth floor. They know they won't be caught, so they... And then the news coverage has a chance to get in their extra little dig. It begins this week, the UPI. Arsonists broke the book depository and spread gasoline over this uh, floors and set fire to the 68-year-old structure where Lee Harvey Oswald waited to assassinate John Kennedy. <laughs> they had to throw that in, you know, his lair. Well, at least they said he waited. They didn't say he did it. Yeah. Well, the other article, uh, <laughs> the adjectives are, are very striking. The, the sick, young, self-styled Marxist <laughs> they sneaked had up waited and fired you know. yeah they have to get the whole trip in for the generation who missed it but that goes under uh destruction of evidence and i put that in my filing cabinet in my head and uh, will write a book on the evidence destroyed in these murder cases to hide um who did this assassination but i say now you know we keep asking to get the national archives open um, to get the coat and the x-rays of John Kennedy. I don't even think it matters to get those things open. These people have been convicted and tried. Oh, <laughs> That's just when oh. there's so much evidence that there was a conspiracy yeah. that you, you'd have to figure out the mathematical chances of all this stuff being destroyed even just by accident. But I just brought on a list, and I've mentioned a few of the things on the program before. The medical x-rays that were never used and the coat of Kennedy's that's locked up, and the car interior that was removed. And that car was sent immediately after the assassination to Michigan and airlifted to Dearborn, and the interior ripped out. So nobody could see if there were extra holes in the car. The clothing of John Conley was sent to the dry cleaner. The FBI never saw it or examined it. It was completely ruined by the time the doctors asked to see it, and the street sign in front of the book depository was removed, and the lamp post directly in front of the depository within, within hours after the assassination, and no one can find out who gave the orders, but I think the street sign was nicked with bullets, and frames of the Zabruder film were cropped. Life magazine bought them right on the spot at Dealey Plaza, gave a million dollars, kept the films. The Warren Commission didn't use them for their work. The uh, notes taken in the Dallas Police Department, the 48 hours at Oswald, was alive were destroyed first they said they didn't take them and then i have people witnesses saying they were there when notes were taken those were thrown thrown away john kennedy ended up with two autopsies one an fbi version that had an extra hole in his back that went finger length and then the one that the warren commission used that the bullet exit is adam's apple and when they wanted to know the discrepancy on the two autopsies they called dr Hume, the navy doctor did the autopsy and he said he destroyed by burning his original orders and oswald's post office application where he filed where he was supposed to have received the gun as a postal federal law that it remained in the post office your box application for two years and they wanted to see what names could receive packages at that post office and they went there and that was destroyed and then Oswald went to an attorney down in New Orleans named Dean Andrews. And he had an honorable discharge from the Marines. And when he went to the Soviet Union, they changed it to dishonorable to make him look like he was not popular at home. He was going to give off the radar secrets. Hmm. You know, that was, so he went to Dean Andrews, and there was a special slip, a special color card. Standard procedure for us, uh, intelligence. To offer information. Uh, well, to fire him once once he's uh, done oh, something. They, oh, yeah. and yeah. They, Well, they gave him a dishonorable because... Yeah, to change it to a dishonorable. Yeah, I just have been reading this book on counterintelligence, the British counterintelligence. It's a new book that was that's out. 
And it goes into how when you make yourself desirable to the other party, you offer them information. Mm -hmm. And it has to be true information or they will, you know, you'll blow your cover and they'll kill you. So you have to give them information. But the party you work for already knows that you're going to offer it. And provisions, so they give you false information. So, well, they give you true information, but then they change. See, Well, like, true information, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. No, like Donovan in the Marines, the officer over Oswald, when he had top security clearance in the Pacific, uh, he said that they routinely change all the codes after a certain time period. Oh. So when Oswald goes to the Soviet Union and said, I'm going to give you all the code names and operations for the Pacific, you know, and at Tsugi mm -hmm. Air Base in the Philippines, and he had memorized all of them and was really sharp at that kind of thing. He offered them the real codes. Then the United States could say, oh, he's not with us anymore. If he's going to give our codes, we have to change our codes. Well, that's standard, too. They always change their codes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But, but in the interim, before they could get wind, Oswald could say, well, I'll give you the codes. Yeah. And they could change them one month before they ch know they're going to change them here because then they're caught, you know? That's no so, problem. No, so in this case, he went to Dean Andrews, an attorney in New Orleans, because this was in September of 63. And, yeah, and after that assignment, Oswald was to go to Mexico, then Dallas, where he was to be a decoy. And he had applied for a university at Austin, Texas. He was supposed to start college as soon as he was cleared of this thing because he didn't own a gun. And he would be arrested while the uh, real assassins leave town. You see, and he was framed. Well, he didn't know that part was going to happen to him. He was in New Orleans, and he'd come home from serving his time in Russia as an agent of uh, the CIA and Navy intelligence. So he went to Dean Andrews, the assigned attorney, to change his discharge, and he was in correspondence with the Secretary of Navy you know, at the time. And Who went, happened to be John Connolly? John Connolly. <laughs> Don't let us forget that. Yeah, and Fred Korth. Uh, before uh, Connolly, there was Fred Korth all the time at Oswald as Navy intelligence. Korth was the attorney for Marguerite Oswald's husband. And uh, as a witness before the Warren Commission, she names Fred Korth. And when she wanted to get a, a divorce from Mr. Ekdahl, that was Lee's stepfather, Fred Korth, as the attorney, brought in three or four people that, Lee, that Margaret Oswald had never met in her life when she was married to Ekdahl, and each one swore different things about her. So she knew that Fred Korth was in on framing Lee. Yeah. And she knew Lee was in Navy intelligence because he had brought in witnesses she had never met, and he knew that he... The, this lawyer was an in intelligence system. And besides, she was KGB. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, I, you're talking about the wife, Marie. I mean Marguerite. Oh, did you say Marguerite? No, oh, I mean uh, Marguerite Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, Mon yeah, got yeah, a divorce right. from Mr. Ekdahl that's when uh, Oswald was an man. adolescent, yeah, 14 or 15. Yeah. And the lawyer who represented her was Fred Korth, who became Secretary of the right, Navy, right, right. who was uh, a big... Uh, wheel in general dynamics down in Fort Worth, Texas, and was president of the bank that got the contract for general dynamics and the famous F-111 yeah. that Lyndon Johnson switched down to Texas for Fred Korth. Infamous. Each one scratches their own back. There's a network, you know, that goes on and on, you know, of people linked like to each word. other. Yeah, well, uh, Dean Andrews, the minute that, that uh, the assassination story broke, uh, about Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans and things, the complete file of Dean Andrews' office were ripped off and everything that he had, the Oswald applications. And he said they had a special color to them, and I know this was a code name, you know, to, who to send it to. Hmm. Then Oswald's passport, um, in the Warren Commission hearings, he had a passport that was marked secret information on it, and it was in the State Department at the time of the assassination on November 23rd, 1963, it was burned. And a lot of his State Department papers were on the desk of the State Department the night of the assassination. So in volume 23 of the Warren Commission hearings on page 188, they asked uh, one of the witnesses about from the State Department about Oswald's passports. And they said, oh, the night of the assassination that was accidentally destroyed while being thermofaxed. Well, that's just uh, 11 instances of evidence destroyed. There's about 38 that we could go into, just like Jack Ruby. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about Jack Ruby's file from his office that was never opened and it was com it was just ripped off about a month ago. It went down to Texas and was ripped off by the moving company. And it never was opened, never was seen mm -hmm. by the Warren Commission. Now it's gone forever. And his possessions were auctioned off, weren't they? No. One thing, the, the gun was Trump. locked up. His wife tried to buy the gun. 
and it's still in Washington. And some men from Oklahoma wanted to buy it right after the assassination. Oh, yeah. And a sale was made, and then another person who's clear conscience said, don't do that, save it around, because we have yet to see that gun fire those shots, you know, in five seconds. That'll be the day, you know, yeah. from the top of the archives. <laughs> so that's evidence destroyed. And um, the article that you read in the paper about the book depository burning down is not as insignificant, you know, as they want it to be. Now, the way you handle espionage agents in foreign countries like Germany or Russia isn't any different than the United States. And a typical example is trying to make the particular agent, if he's caught, appear insane. Um, in the Soviet Union, they send them to mental hospitals and say they're insane if they begin to talk or know too much. And in Germany, they would shoot them and say they, they were shot while they were trying to escape. America uses both systems. We're the best of all. Anything to destroy their credibility. Well, we're the best of all possible worlds. Like <laughs> when they want to kill George Jackson, they were planning it down at Soledad yeah. for a year and a half. Finally, they just had to say he was escaping. You know, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a big mess. And we, you know, there's certain people, revolutionaries, or people onto the system in Attica. You know, they could take all of them in one fell swoop. And we do this all the time with with guys that are escaping. But the people in power today are having a little trouble because one man who was supposed to die, uh, George Wallace, is still alive, and he's very, very sick. Uh, have you read the articles? How really sick he is? Uh, yeah, he's supposed to be improving. No, I don't think he's not improving. I, I would be surprised if he made it. His physical condition exactly. is just terrible. Yeah, a bullet. He had just eaten lunch, and the bullet punctured his intestines, and they went all inside of him, and Honestly. they had to take all of his intestines out. Re and lay it on top of his chest and do a very complicated surgery and didn't get all of it out. Hmm. It punctured a lot, spleen and the right? pancreas and everything. Yeah, I mean, he was really in bad shape. That's why they waited on the other surgery. And he has a lot of spunk, and if he lives, I think he'll follow this thing through. But the He Nixon, seems to be recovering. Yeah, the Nixon administration is trying to put off the trial of Bremer, and they've put it off now till July 31st. You know, they want to put off the Democratic suit against the Republican committee to investigate Nixon, the Watergate uh, suit. Well, they're trying to put off the trial of Bremer. This is July 31st. In the interest of national defense. Yeah, and, <laughs> and the excuse is we have to do a little more mental testing. Well, Bremer is really mad. Um, the New York Times says Bremer, who's two years old, has refused to go to the state psychiatrist. They misprinted that. Yeah. <laughs> but he's not insane, and he's refused. Yeah. The New York Times says that he has refused to cooperate with medical or psychiatric examination. I think they'd make him a vegetable. I don't see how John Mitchell and Patrick Gray and Richard Nixon can survive if, if this boy survives. And I don't see any reason not to make him a vegetable because uh, he's in a very delicate position because he was hired and he was seen with accomplices. And Patrick Gray is waiting to be appointed the head of the FBI. He's closed the case. It was an obvious conspiracy. In three weeks, he closed the In case. In three weeks, he closed it. And, and nobody has said what members of the Milwaukee Club he associated with. This boy worked there three steady years. They keep referring to him as a busboy in Chandler. Nobody's told why he was staying at the Waldorf Astoria in, no. uh, what was it, uh, oh, they, $80? $80. Lord Elgin, yeah, eighty dollars. Lord Elgin Hotel up in Canada, or the Elgin, yeah. Sheraton Hotel in Maryland, you know, and was coming back for more reservations. He had, now it seems he took an airplane. He was going more than a thousand miles a day and traveling all around. See, well, that's an obvious conspiracy. What are they going to do with Bremer? What do you think they can do with him? Well, I'm glad it's their problem and not mine. <laughs> I, I I'll listen it this way. <laughs> I'm glad it's their problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that they have a problem. Yeah. See, what what happens is. If Wallace had died, Bremer would have been given a deal like James Ray, like maybe with no trial, or he would have been isolated like mm -hmm. Sirhan and the other yeah. assassins. See, so now they're stuck with a man who isn't dead. He's just damaged for life and hanging between life and death. But they've stuck with Bremer, who could have access to writers or researchers or, you know, computer and automation came out with an article. Uh, we'll cover it next week. We don't have time this whole week, but it's on the shooting of Wallace. It's the newest issue. And for those of you who are new to the show, I bring up this magazine all the time, Computer and Automation, and um, Edmund Barclay is the editor. And it's, it comes out of New England, and he's on his second year now, and every single issue he has questions of political assassinations. And this issue is only on 
how many bullets were in George Wallace. You see, there were five in George Wallace's body, and you know, there mm. were three of people staying in the right. shopping center. Right. Now, this article comes up with 10 wounds on four individuals. Wallace and a man and a guard and another lady. So you have... <laughs> from a five-shot five revolver. From a shot, five-shot revolver. Does you know, this is a, good that this is one of the first articles out on Wallace because yeah, it's going right to the bullets. Does this sound familiar where you have more bullets than a gun? Familiar. Yeah, with the Robert Kennedy shooting the ambassador, the L.A. Police Department has ten bullets with an eight-bullet revolver, and Sirhan got off about three or four. Yeah. Oh, there was another uh, question of destruction of evidence or terrorizing this week. Sirhan's brothers had a press conference mm. and a TV show in L.A., and they were talking about the fact that the truth should be told that their brother didn't kill Robert Kennedy and they want the evidence brought out, the ballistics brought out. And so this week, Mary Saran had a fight and said that her sons tried to burn her house down and she called the police. That first part of that, uh, what you just said, was not in the papers that I read. No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, no. The part about the, the news conference, the only thing that was in the paper was the fact that yeah. the mother was threatened by the two sons, and they didn't say why she was threatened yeah, or isn't, anything. Isn't that disgusting? Yeah, they, really. They do this all the time. Um, they tell you that, that the house was going to be burned down, the mother's having trouble with the boys, I take eight papers a day, and that I get in the news. But the question of the brothers having the news conference on TV or in L.A. came through the L.A. Times. And uh, that wasn't in the papers. By taking eight yeah. papers a day, this came, that came through the L.A. Free Press. But I take the uh, L.A. Free Press, the L.A. Star, and the L.A. News Advocate. There's three underground papers, and they're carrying a lot of things. Yeah, they're really good. On Sir Han and on Lewis Tackwood and on all these cases, but you don't get it otherwise. And uh, uh, it's very important to, to take some of the underground papers and analyze what's happening. I got a note here. We'll take a station break, and uh, I'll answer this postcard. I got. I like to answer the mail. Someone handed me a note, and we'll take a break on. Is that from Abe Bremer. All, all you have to do is say KLRB. This is the only break. This is, okay. This is KLRB, and I have a guest here today. Phil Kogan's on a vacation. KLRB Carmel. Carmel, Carmel California. I think <laughs> this is KLRB Carmel, California. Got it. Okay, and Phil is on vacation, and I have a guest here, Harry Powell, a young gentleman who's been a listener to the show for a year, and I explained the first of the show, has read a lot of books on the subject, is becoming what the government, the establishment doesn't like. They call us assassination buffs. You've joined the classification of buffs. You've read three or more books, and you're knowledgeable on most of the political assassinations, pretty much, and uh, that's pretty good. I just had a postcard. It's Call just, us troublemakers. Is it just a line to say every Saturday at four, my three neighbors and my wife gather around and have coffee and listen to Mae Russell keep up? Question: What is going to happen after the Republican convention? Is Nixon going to run? Um, let me tell you. Uh, if you listen to the show every week, I did one two weeks ago and three weeks ago at the Watergate after June when the uh, Watergate Hotel was broken into in Washington D.C. And uh, mm -hmm. that was where John and Martha Mitchell live. And the Republican committee broke into the Democratic headquarters. And I'm going to do a show next week on, I'll do on the Republican convention because we're warming up. And uh, I, what I would like to see, this is May's fantasy. <laughs> May's fantasy would be that Richard Nixon doesn't run at all, that he's tried for murder <laughs> of Robert Kennedy, and that Agnew be investigated for his connections to the secret clandestine government that is the hidden government that I talk about every week. For those of you that follow the show seriously every week, I've said there's two governments in the United States and the elections are a mockery and that there is no such thing as a two-party system and that if these political assassinations aren't discussed in the open, very soon McGovern doesn't stand a chance to live. I don't think he does. There's enough evil people ready to kill him, to cancel elections. And we're working against time now. We have till November. And I'm going down to L.A. in a week and a half and have a press conference. Mark Lane will be there. He's one of the first people to do research on the political assassination. He wrote Rush to Judgment. And um, Lewis Tackwood, the agent that I've talked about, who talked about the plans to overthrow the government, that the hidden government have been arranging for several years 
Tackwood has a book coming out called The Glass House Tapes. I just finished a chapter for that book, and my articles will be out in August, How Richard Nixon Came to Power and the Watergate Affair. And hopefully, it depends how much of a news blackout there is or the response to this kind of information. There shouldn't even be elections until we go to the Los Angeles Police Department and count those bullets and look at the gun and find out if the man who ran against Richard Nixon in 1964 was killed so that Nixon wouldn't have any competition because Humpty Dumpty is uh, the McCar you know, he's the little puppet uh, that sits on Nixon's knee. If Humphrey had won by a fluke, there wouldn't have been any difference in the White House. Little Humpty Dumpty would Humpty. be Humpty Dumpty would be sitting there. He's just right out of the Central Intelligence Agency, and he's their perfect little puppet, and he's a little milk toast. You know, that wasn't an election in '68, and this is no election this time because everyone's going to be caught off guard by surprise. system and Wall Street. The president of Wall Street just resigned to work for Lockheed, mm. a bankrupt organization. That means the war is going to go on. It's going to be good for Wall Street. Because I just, I can't see how they're going to let the uh, McGovern be elected. No, no. By a popular vote, like Kennedy. No, I have some friends here today in the in the room with me. Harry's from the South, from uh, Texas. Another friend here from Oklahoma, and uh, her daddy's a cattleman there. And there's just. No way that they're, these men are, and my own family in Los Angeles, well, I don't know how they feel about this thing now, but I'm not going to speak for them. But I know that there are forces in this country, in the aerospace, in the um, whole space shuttle system, in the Vietnamese, in Asia, our budget went up just for a cost overrun of 77 weapon systems. It was $28 billion this week, $28 billion. Oh, what was that you were telling me? In a cost overrun. The other day about the daily cost of the war? Yeah, it's so a hundred million. Hundred million. A hundred million a day. You know, in the time that we're spending here, you know, in this one hour, wow. divided up, you know, twenty-four into that hundred million, just for a nothing war, a nothing mm. war. Well, the bases are growing in in Thailand. You know, really heavy. Uh, we intend to stay at Asia. There's a lot of oil in Asia. There's a lot of oil in Alaska. We can control it through the space agency and von braun and has his hands in that oil he resigned the space to control that oil there are powers the standard oil rockefeller he just opened a deal now to start bringing oil from russia and i've mentioned before the interest that rockefeller and john j mccloy who was on the warren commission having the the oil in the ukraine they're just not about to let the third world the people the human beings get their thing together you know it, somebody asked me about the election i don't see any way knowing as much as I do about how these people moved into power. Uh, head of the American Bar Association, Leon Jaworski, worked at uh, CIA foundations, represented Texas at the time of the uh, assassination for the Warren Commission, and John Conley, waiting to be one of the top men in the country who was in, who knew about the assassination to kill Kennedy. When Garrison wanted a certain witness, Sergio Acacia Smith Conley wouldn't extradite him. If he wanted to find out and clear all the rumors, Conley could have cleared all the rumors a long time ago. See, if people think, uh, you know, like the question says, what's going to happen after the convention? Um, Conley changed his story uh, on the bullet that hit him, too. Oh, well, that, first he said it was a different bullet than the one that hit Kennedy, and then later on he didn't, he well, went through that. He still kept it that it was a different bullet. You see, that's well, his power. Yeah, that's, but he didn't. You know, by his not agreeing with the Warren Commission, Harry, this is his power. Like he says, I know right. what happened. But he didn't make a big public thing out of it. But it's very clear that yeah, he doesn't clear. think that what he says is true to happen to him. Right. That Oswald didn't do it. But that's just holding something over the yeah. people in Washington. Yeah, that's his end. See, but... that'll make him the president of the United States, that bullet, that extra bullet. <laughs> because it's what you have on people, you know, mm -hmm. that... that uh, uh, there's a lot of blackmail all the way up, and Conley was the, the state of Texas was, was controlled, and Conley could handle that. Let's jump. You know, we're talking about conspiracies here. We're on to Bremer and his mental condition, and uh, uh, also there was another thing about Martha Mitchell. Bremer says, don't play around with my brain. I'm not mentally sick. And Martha Mitchell had another quick telephone conversation, and she says, I'm not mentally sick. And, and she said, be sure I'm all right, and I have a lot to tell. And she's not going to accept that story either, that she's mentally loony. Let's jump right now for the second half hour to the 
conspiracy in California, because that's a long subject. It really deserves a whole show. We have yeah, 20 minutes so. left. This, uh, I talk every week about conspiracies to kill the president of the United States and people like Martin Luther King. But there are conspiracies in the state that are linked to the national conspiracies, like Lewis Tackwood names people in the state that are linked to the national conspiracies. And a newspaper called the San Francisco Bay Guardian. Now, this newspaper in San Francisco, I'll give you the address. I think people should send for it. It's 1070 Bryant Street in San Francisco, 94013. I'm giving you the address because I can't possibly cover this in uh, the 20 minutes. I'll just give you the gist of this article. San Francisco Bay Guardian, and it's the story of the Soledad frame-up. And it's the story about a psychiatrist who lived in Monterey named Frank Rundle, who was the only psychiatrist out at Soledad. Um, don't you think they should have had one a long time ago? It's amazing that he was the chief psychiatrist. I know they should have had one. With all those problems. Yeah. Well, this newspaper has a list of the, the climate. What it, it has an article of what was happening at Soledad when a particular prisoner came in there as a prisoner. And Tony, his name is Tony Pewitt. He was sent to Soledad, and he was a fairly good prisoner. He was in on a stolen car problem. He was considered not violent, and he worked with psychiatrist Rundle at Soledad. And several guards were killed at Soledad in the time that Tony was in that prison. And they wanted the prison system out of Evelyn Younger's office, the Attorney General of California, and the, um, what other, the California Correction System, and the District Attorney Curtis in Monterey County, we talk about him all the time, they wanted to frame Rundle as being a radical and get Faye Stender, who they called a radical. She's a lawyer who represents the underdog. She lives in San Francisco. And Rundle complained about the conditions in Soledad, and he spoke up with the trial, the first hearings of Hugo Pinnell that we've talked about on this show. And he said, Pinnell lives in a dark, dirty, miserable cell with garbage all around. And he testified he had neurological disorders. He couldn't be treated there. It was a filthy, dirty place. So Rundle was trying to get some changes. He said they were treating these people like animals. And the prison system then said, well, we'll frame him for the conspiracy to murder a couple of guards. We'll get him in on that conspiracy. We'll take care of Rundle, mm -hmm. you know, as well as the other prisoners. Yeah. Do you want to make a few points on that? You read the article. What do you think? Uh, the gist of the article, I'm giving you the address, and we'll talk about a few isolated points. The gist was that a prisoner was offered three years parole if he would go to Rundle's home, and they wired him up with all kind of sound, and the prison authority sat in a car outside, and he was uh, coached with what to say to try to get Rundle in on the conspiracy to, so they could charge him with conspiracy to murder, too. Right. Uh, well, it just shows that... Uh the California conspiracy, the purpose of it is to uh, to get the radical troublemakers out of the system. Yeah, well, and by definition, a radical is a guy who sees a man sleeping with garbage. Oh, sure. Well, I... I and these aren't even communists. <laughs> I trust everybody knows what I mean when I say radical. Yeah. <laughs> Tongue-in-cheek. Uh, uh, and they, they threaten people with longer prison terms in order to force them to capitulate. Uh, Pewitt was threatened well, actually, he was told he would be given parole, and then they said they would not give him his parole and make him stay in jail three years extra. If he didn't frame if Rundle. If he didn't frame Rundle. Now, Rundle happened to be a very good friend of Pewitt's. Uh, in fact, as May said, Pewitt was his assistant. So uh, Pewitt's, uh, he said all he could think of was three extra years in prison. So he went on into Rundle's house and... Uh, wrote him notes while keeping up a mundane conversation. He wrote a note in and, his uh, pictures in the Guardian. He says, I'm wired for sound. It's yeah. really heavy, wasn't it? He w ripped open his shirt and he had mics on. Yeah, there's a picture. He says, it's like I'm having an EKG. He said he, had, he was bugged and wired and all the way down to his shoes and everything. And he, he went to the kitchen to have some drinks and, and Rundle didn't know what to do. So he wrote back a note while they're having a conversation. What do we do? So Pewitt says, we'll go out and get a Coke. And he called mm -hmm. some detectives in Monterey who went over and took a picture of the wiring system. Took affidavits. Yeah, and the rented car. They let him out of jail with a rented car. 
and restaurant receipts and all this stuff. And he was supposed to implicate and make conversation and get this psychiatrist in on a murder charge. Oh, yeah, they used the uh, credit card of his fiance's father <laughs> to, uh, bla that was another uh, blackmail. He bought a pair of shoes, so they said, right. yeah. His fiance bought him a pair of shoes with her father's credit card. Yeah. And then her father decided, uh, under it, pressure from the prison system, decided to prosecute uh, Pewitt. Then the so there he was. That's right. And then to show a statewide conspiracy, when he got back into the arms of law enforcement men, they said, well, you really blew it, so you're going to jail for three years. So they sent him down near Bakersfield. They got him on a murder rap of a thing that hadn't been solved for years. And they oh, said, it was a four-year-old case. Four-year-old murder rap. And they said, you're involved in this murder rap. Yeah. And the only thing that saved this guy from going to jail he was willing to go to jail three more years to help Ronald not be in a conspiracy charge. But the only thing that saved his life from being in jail on a murder rap, imagine framing for a murder, was that Rondell called a lawyer and detectives and had everything taken down. Publicity. See, when you're in jail, you can't even, a lawyer has to come to you. So they had everything set. And then when Rundle wrote up to the California Department of Corrections, they dropped all the charges and uh, didn't want a suit going on. But the um, the opinion, this is the, the opinion of the author who wrote the article. We can go into some more details. He said, I believe that when the Soledad killings began, these killings, let me stop, were the ones where the blacks and whites went out in the yard, and that's the time when they were really going to get Jackson the first time when these killings began. And well, um, We know that's what they told us that yeah. happened. We don't even know if that's well, they let happened. Yeah, the guard just shot three blacks yeah. just in cold blood and the grand jury said justifiable homicide so then there was a fight and a white guard was shot and then the blacks were charged with murder um, so when the, he said I believe that when the Soledad killings began most prison officials were too insensitive to believe that anything was wrong with the prisons and they blame outside agitators the underground rat press the radical lawyers the number of black panthers that enter the prisons Everything except the human conditions that the prisoners were rebelling about is blamed. Well, this is why, let me just stop here for one minute, this is what happens in our society, or with Hitler, or with Agnew, or Mitchell, or Nixon. Every time people scream and yell about human conditions in America, they say, well, those are the radicals talking. If we say the prisons are oppressive, they say you're a radical. Right. They take your fingerprint when you go to a trial like Hugo Pinnell's, they take your photograph, you become an enemy of the state if you want to know if Hugo's going to be tortured. You are considered an enemy. And you, can't, you can't go in and watch Hugo Pinnell's trial without being called a pig. No. By the uh, police. <laughs> by the police. They take your finger. They don't take your finger. They take your handwriting. You have to sign something. They check your mm -hmm. handwriting. And they take your driver's license or identification. And then... They, they search you with a metal detector. Search course. you with that. They did, yeah. And then most, some of these trials, like Angela Davis and up the saw that they took pictures of everyone going in or out. Oh, yes, and after they get your name and have you identified, they run a uh, check on you with their data banks. Do they? Uh, yes, and if you have any outstanding traffic tickets, remember that, that girl that was picked up? She had an outstanding traffic ticket, so they... On the way home from the trial, they has. No, she was in, oh, really? in the trial, and they grabbed her, and they said they took her, uh, put her under arrest, and uh, told her she was going to have to pay it right then, or... I don't remember that. During Hugo's trial? Yeah, during Hugo's trial. Oh, God. Well, that's what they did at the Angela trial. I know. See, so if you have any, anything uh, pending on you, then they'll, uh, they'll pick you up if you try to get into trial. Oh, in that, tactics, right? that's terrible. Well, this uh, article says, Dr. Rundle was the first insider, the first one to complain about the prisons decisively. Imagine that. George Jackson, this young boy, was in on a, a $90 thing he stole and he was in a hole six years and nobody saw him just solitary isolated confinement and uh, this fellow Dupuy was kept in confinement down there too and couldn't see anyone yeah, after the Bakersfield charge in a yeah. dark hole how many months it was months before anybody could get to him mm -hmm. and so Rundle was the first insider to complain about the prison not only did he criticize the security cells but he threatened to take his case to the public if necessary that makes you a radical you see that is where the trouble if you take it to the public and that's why the conditions are as bad as they are, because most people don't take anything to the public. They don't have the courage to see it. I mean, just like, uh, uh, I shouldn't digress, but I think about Ellsberg this week. His trial's going on, and he's complaining that people haven't read the Pentagon Papers. And he said, oh, my goodness, I tried to tell you so much, and mm. no, none of the potential jurors read it, nobody read it. 
And uh, is he listening to dialogue assassination? Well, you know, <laughs> why didn't he take the other problems to the public? You know, there was a funny thing. One man that they called in on the jury there had read the Pentagon Papers and found them really interesting. And he blew it. He should have just yeah. said he hadn't read them. He finally got someone who read them, and then the judge sent him off. So what good does it do to read? They say, no, you can't be on if you've read them. Yeah, they let them on if they got a security clearance, but they don't let them on if they read the Pentagon. I'll tell you what. If I were on that jury and they called me, I wouldn't say I read them. I think a system that's this corrupt, that locks everything up, that does all their secrecy. <laughs> don't say that. Harry says I shouldn't say that on the air. Okay, I take it back. <laughs> Let's go on to Rundle. My older conscience here. <laughs> Okay. The Guardian said it wasn't enough to fire Rundle. The blood had to be drawn from him. Can I say that? That's a California Corrections for me. I didn't say it. The Guardian said <laughs> it's it. It's a quote. Blood had to be drawn from Rundle. So from then on, incredible power and resources were thrown into action. Now, this is true. The credit card people, the Bakersfield police, everyone. I said the parents of Pewitt's fiance, the correctional officers, a credit card criminal complaint was turned on and then off by somebody. The Attorney General of uh, Office in California did some of this. It was intricate bugging machinery that was paid for, private planes, money for these expenses, phony passes to leave the prison. Homicide detectives came in from another county. All of this was done to come down on Rundle because he said that the prison conditions were not bearable. And he wouldn't turn over his the reason they tried to frame him to it is that one of the fellows that they suspected of killing a guard had been a patient of Rundle's up to that time. Oh, that and they long. wanted his psychiatric reports. Well, they weren't reports after he killed the guard saying, I the killed him, right. you know, what will I do? It wasn't a confession. But even then, but it was, what he had there was, was a discussion of headaches and problems before he was accused of killing a guard. They didn't was, prove they, they were confidential, and he wouldn't turn them over. So they took them from him and fired him. And he said, no, if I turn over what the prisoner says to me, then no one will have my confidence in this prison. No one will ever trust another psychiatrist. That's right. I mean, and he's the only friend they had inside there. Can you imagine how lonely it is inside those walls? So now we'll just, uh, the, the prisoners won't have to worry now because the psychiatrist will be will be court appointed. <laughs> so There's no psychiatrist. Well, no, or, or no psychiatrist at all. Yeah. The, what they get is a marine sergeant who retired and he's taking over the prison. You know, there's a lot of retired. Helping with their problems. Yeah, there's retired military that come in and, and uh, uh, take over, you know. Now, it's, as far as the election goes, another answer um, I did want to bring up because last week I didn't do it was McGovern's acceptance speech because a lot of people have asked me, always asked me about the elections. Who's going to win? Who should we vote for? And now the, the chances are narrowed down to McGovern and Nixon. And can McGovern live? That's the question. But uh, so far, he's being very honest. His background seems good. I am certainly going to encourage everyone every week to register and vote and get behind him. Yeah, it seems to me that George McGovern, the further or actually the more success that he gets, or, uh, the more success that he has, the, the fir more he gets his foot in the door, he's, he begins to uh, tell us a little more of what he knows about the government. Uh, yeah. Because in this acceptance speech uh, was by far the most he has said about this Nixon administration, you know, about the secrecy, yeah. the uh, killing, uh, how it's uh, based on death instead of life, et cetera. Well, I was very impressed with the acceptance speech because um, I felt that he brought up many points that I'm going to have in the, the article, How Richard Nixon Came to Power. And one of the important things, he talks about the problems of the last 30 years, and it's been just since 1942 that, our, that this country changed it, its whole atmosphere. It was never one of great equality, and we always had a bunch of rednecks. Even before uh, 42, we had a bunch of people worrying about blacks, and, and there was oppression and lack of equal opportunity. But it was a, half, a haphazard kind of a racism, a latent jealousy of, of minorities and misunderstanding. It wasn't a systematic ripoff that we got after we incorporated the losers from World War II, the Nazis. That didn't give us war babies much of a chance. No, not at all. The war babies had no chance at all because at the time you were all being born. Um, it was already gone. They were all making deals with Reinhard Galen and Nazi intelligence to keep the war going and the Red War scare going and the, the hot and cold war. And 
And I think that the real problems of our prob country began uh, in 1942. Project Paperclip is that book I always refer to, the importation of the Nazis, incorporating them into the American system and setting up their headquarters here down Jamaica and uh, putting them into defense industries and they're into the law system here, they're into the press, they're into the social scientists. I was just reading an article in the New York Times about this particular Nazi who, who went to Texas to the prisoner of war school and he was given books and, and worked on rocket systems and he runs a foundation in Germany that works in social scientists, psychiatry, mental health and every facet of our life, law and everything. Which and school was that? Prisoner it's of War? His, it, no, he went to a, he was a prisoner of war during World War II mm -hmm. and he was caught in a submarine and he was saying to Texas, did you know there's a big school there for prisoners of war in no, Texas of German Nazis? Where? Uh, I'll look up the name of the city. You're from Texas. <laughs> it's right next. Not from. I live there. I'm not from there. Harry's right next door to your house. <laughs> you didn't know it. Didn't even know that. Go home with all this in mind, and you'll look it over differently. But they were. Uh, this group of prisoner war went right from Nazi Germany to Texas. Well, do the people in Monterey know that there are the biggest spy school on the West Coast is right, <laughs> right here? here. <laughs> they don't know that either. We talked about that once on a show about the Nazis yeah. right out there with, with their little swastikas on the desk and their little plane. <laughs> well, well Mr. Smith. Uh, in his acceptance speech, uh, McGovern speaks about the last 40 years. And then he also said, he said, Nixon said 10 years ago, you won't have me to kick around. And he said, if we all get together, we'll redeem that pledge this time. But he spoke, this is McGovern's speech, he said, we stand today not as a collection of backroom strategists or special interests, but a direct reflection of the public will. See? And let the opponent stand for the status quo and we'll refresh the American spirit. And let the opposition collect their 10 million in secret money from the privileged and let one million ordinary Americans contribute $25 each to win the campaign, and we'll have a McGovern Club of a million members. See, so he could have a million members for $25 each. I'm sending $25 and registering. I wasn't a registered Democrat because I was not. If Humphrey Goddard or George Jackson or Mus uh, Muscat wouldn't even bother to vote. I, I even now, I, I still wonder if I, I don't think I'll be in this country in November, but if you want to vote for somebody, <laughs> You vote for McGovern if he's alive. Otherwise, uh, I still I can't see a way out yet mm -hmm. of this quagmire of people. Uh, they've been fed so much propaganda that if he died, they'd feel we were relieved. Wall Street is calling him a menace. Reagan was in Ireland saying the country would be set back a thousand years if he won. I've never heard such dirty talk. There was so much little behind it. Mm -hmm. Really hate talk. This isn't political talk. This is dirty hate. Well, as... Uh as uh, Goering, I'm sure everybody's familiar with uh, Goering, Goering said uh, in the 30s, uh, it doesn't really matter what's true, all that matters is what everybody believes. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, the, well the people that wrote Goering's speeches right, you know, for the administration. Well, Goering wrote his own speeches. <laughs> he was Minister of Propaganda, but you know, uh, if you put a lie out over the air, such as the media uh, oft times does, then that's what the people know as truth. That's right. Even though it's not the truth, that's what they, well, they man, wrote it in the paper. A man like Haldeman, there was a question in the paper this week, how does Haldeman get so much power in the White House? You talk about press and communications. Yeah. Some woman wrote in, I went to school with him and he was really brilliant and what's he just doing as the communications man? He has one of the most important jobs in the United just. States. Yeah, sure. I mean, he, he's the one that says, we won't have news conferences because you ask silly and stupid questions. He has evaluated the newsman in this country is not even being worthy to talk to. Because he doesn't want the questions asked, he turns it around. Your questions aren't even worth seeing you about. This is a very dangerous administration that people don't realize. I've been spending the last week cleaning up my uh, cross-filing system, getting a lot of articles in order, and there's about 1,800 subjects I'm cross-filing. They all pertain to the political assassinations, and one of them is the news media and how the news is perverted and the truths are never told. And so that if Nixon is afraid to answer a question on any sensitive subject, uh, he just says, well, you're too stupid. You asked the wrong questions. Well, uh, for instance, get back to Martha, uh, yeah. how the news media has misrepresented her. Jack Anderson came out with a column uh, talking about how she uh, was irresponsible with her children and... Uh, 
Let their uh, teeth rot is let their teeth. teeth. <laughs> and uh, Life magazine did a spread of Was that uh, disgusting? Of Martha Mitchell. There smiling. was a woman who was supposed to be the hostess at the Republican convention. She was the most wanted woman at the Republican parties for fundraising. fundraising. I also have Spire Agnew. A little sweetheart. <laughs> Tash Shriver, the uh, head of Music Corporation of America, had a party for her and Mrs. Nixon. I mean, they, they socialized. They were close friends. There was no problem. They loved her big mouth, you know. And, and then when they found out that she had seen a crime at the Watergate Hotel, then Life magazine came in and had her dancing on the lawn like a an idiot, you know, everything but drilling for the mouth, like she was just really freaked out. If you get a chance, go check out that Life magazine. I think it was a week or two ago that came out there. Yeah. Full page spread of Martha Mitchell. In a yellow dress, let me really silly grins and looking stupid, you know. And uh, just completely destroyed her credibility. Yeah. Because who would believe that? Who well, would believe a woman like that? McGovern said, America, the time has come for truth. There's a time for everything and a time for truth and not falsehood. And truth is a habit of integrity, not a strategy of politics. I think a lot of the things he said in his acceptance speech are excellent, and I've tried to live by them. I, I think truth is a matter of habit of integrity. You can't find certain truths. And if, if Ellsberg is having trouble raising money for his defense, and the liberals aren't behind him and nobody trusts him, uh, they... It is a matter of integrity. When he saw the Pentagon Papers, he also knew or had to know what happened to John Kennedy. Because, as I've said before on the show, the Pentagon Papers, one hunk of it, ends with DM, has DM being killed in the very next one, like 52 and 53. Their consecutive has Kennedy dead after DM's conversation with Henry Cavett Lodge. We and have the war Lyndon was Johnson. Escalated the next That's, day. <laughs> well, November the 24th, we have the escalation with Lyndon yeah, Johnson. Of course. So you have um, truth is a habit of integrity, and when people don't have that habit, if they're selective in their truths, they're not even going to support Ellsberg when he comes along. Yeah. Well, Harry, it looks like it's time to wind up. Thanks a lot for coming and helping me out doing dialogue conspiracy. You like to do it? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, we talk on the phone, Harry, and Beverly. I have a lot of friends that keep up with all the latest news, so he thought he'd share the program with me today, and uh, thanks a lot for coming. You're welcome. Okay.